Okay, I guess we're live and ready to go. It's five after nine, roughly. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, had a couple of little technical issues that we had to address, but I'd uh, like to uh, welcome everybody to this morning's meeting. Uh, we're going to be uh, hearing uh, this morning from uh, Kim Crosby and uh, Kerry uh, Thompson, um, and uh, one's a milk bottler uh, and, and reseller. And um, Kim is with uh, Casella Waste, and um, she's the compliance officer there. And I believe we're going to talk some about uh, the unwrap uh, uh, machine that, or whatever it is. We're going to find out. <laughs> Um, but anyhow, um, we're, um, we're dealing a lot uh, with uh, food waste, food scraps, uh, composting on farms. And so that, that issue is, um, you know, important to us and how it's working. Uh, but before we get into that uh, with you, Kim, um, and I don't, is there any reason, Carrie? Do you have a time crunch or no? No, good. I'm good for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so we'll have the committee introduce themselves, and then uh, yeah, boy, that looks better, Pearson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've just been zoom bombed. Yeah. <laughs> Forgive so, me, uh, kids at home on Wednesday. Uh, would you like to, uh, the committee could introduce themselves, please? Good morning, Chris Pearson from Chittenden County. Anthony Polito, Washington County. Brian Collimore from Rutland County. Corey Grant from Franklin County and Alberg. And I'm Bobby Starr, and I'm from Essex Orleans County. So with that, um, I'd like to, again, welcome both of you folks to our, our meeting this morning and uh, I guess turn it over to Kim who uh, will fill us in on uh, DRAP or so. <laughs> from this. So anyways, uh, the floor is yours, Kim, and um, we, uh, we run kind of a informal uh, meeting, I guess you'd call it. Uh, so as you go, you may get some questions on on issues as you know we all listen. Sure. So well, welcome and the floor is yours. Well, thank you for inviting me um, to be here today to, to discuss um, Casello's newly installed depackaging operation. Uh, for the record, I'm Kim Crosby, Environmental Compliance Manager with Casella Way Systems, which is based out of Rutland. My office is actually here in Montpelier. Um, we operate waste and recycling facilities and provide collection services throughout the state of Vermont, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania. Um, for your reference, and if you're interested in learning more um, about Casella's operations, I have a two-page report that provides an overview of what we do and volumes and types of materials we collect that I sent over to Linda yesterday. Um, that report also includes um, a link to our biannual sustainability report that I highly recommend checking out in your spare time. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to say, you know, also for the record that, you know, we're aware of the existing issues or discussions related to feeding of food scraps to chickens. Um, we have been supportive and actually have testified in support of allowing that activity to continue um, and be regulated by the Department of Agriculture. Um, you know, we think feeding food scraps to chickens and allowing farms to use food scraps as compost is an essential part of the implementation of the universal recycling law. Um, and it's certainly a great option for managing some of the source separated organics. Um, and since we've been following along on that topic, we heard some concerns about the depackaging operations. So we thought it would be a good time to come in and talk about the facility that we recently installed um, at our transfer station located in Williston. Um, so with the final phase of the organic span, um, we recognized that there was a large portion of the organic waste stream that isn't source separated. 
Um, and prior to July 1st, um, that material was going to the landfill for disposal. And then after July 1st, disposal was not gonna be um, an option for that material any, any longer. Um, and without a facility in state, this material would have to be sent to an out of state depackaging facility. Um, depackaging facilities do exist in other states like Maine and Massachusetts. Um, I believe two of the depackaging facilities in Mass are actually co located with a digester on a farm. So, recognizing that there was a need to manage packaged material, um, we began permitting and constructing a depackaging operation that would provide an in state solution for our customers. So, Linda, I'm going to need permission to share now. You have it. Did you not get it? Um, Your co host. Now, where do I get to it? <laughs> Go to uh, share screen. Can you see that? No. Well, I'll be happy to share. Give me one sec here. Okay. Yeah. Are you are you folks Kim hooked up with someone with a digester or? Yes. Yep. We are. Yep. Um, it's Purpose Energy in Burlington, South Burlington. With that's. Um, located at the Magic Hat Brewery. Yeah. Okay, so Linda, if you could just go to the next slide. That'd be great, thank you. Oh, yep, right there. So this is an overview um, of the operation of the facility. Um, the unit can process around 20 tons an hour. Uh, we have three 15,000 gallon tanks on site for organic slurry storage. Um, we can process and remove contaminants from our residential and commercial organic collection routes and bring that material to a certified compost facility. Um, we installed a baler so we can bale and recycle cardboard packaging and boxes. And as I was just saying, the organic slurry that will be produced will be transported to the digester operated by Purpose Energy in South Burlington. Um, the digester uses organic waste streams to generate biogas that powers Magic Hat's boiler and cogeneration system. Um, we're also planning to backhaul some of their gray water to the digester to use in our depackaging facility to process certain types of materials in lieu of using you know, clean water, thus we'd be saving on water consumption. Um, and we do anticipate formally opening the facility at the end of February. Um, we had hope, hoped to open sooner, but um, construction got delayed a few months because of the pandemic. So next slide, Linda, unless anyone has any questions. Um, the, it, it sounds like you're utilizing everything either the cardboard or styrofoam, uh, you're getting rid of that in a recyclable way as along with the meat products? Right, so if, if the packaging is recyclable packaging, then we can recycle it. And if it's not, then we'll, we're obviously gonna have to take it over to the transfer station for disposal. But we did put a baler in, which you can see down at the bottom of that um, site plan um, for cardboard that was typically in the past getting disposed of. So we'll be diverting more of that from disposal, which will be great. So you can see the, um, the tipping area. There's two bunkers there labeled tipping area that will store um, the material as it comes in. And then right above those bunkers, there's a, a hopper where the material will get loaded into and that feeds the unit um, right above that hopper. And inside that, that unit, there are paddles that kind of bang the, the organic material out of the packaging. And below those paddles, there's a series of screens and you can change out the screens depending upon the material that you're processing. So we could bring those screens down to a quarter of an inch in size. And so if, there, if it's a liquid material that we're processing and we're adding water to it, um, that will get conveyed to those um, 15,000 gallon tanks if it's a dry product that we're processing, it'll come out one of those chutes, it'll be conveyed with a large, looks like a large screw 
through one of those shoots and it will drop out into a roll off container and we can take that either you know again depending upon what it is to a compost facility or maybe it could be animal feed um, and then we have one the trash stays on top of those screens below the paddles and moves out and is conveyed out through a separate chute and disposed of in a roll off container. Any questions there? <clears throat> uh, it's it's pretty hard to, to see, but well, I got some other pictures that'll yeah. give you a better view of it. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Chair, I have a question. Um, well, two questions. Kim, uh, I don't usually go for uh, sort of uh, grand openings. Uh, as a senator, we get invited to that stuff. But this is so cool. If you do invite yeah. people, please, uh, please think of me. Oh, and I'll be glad to come yeah. check it out just because I'm very curious about it. How, yeah. um, how automated is it versus labor intensive? Like, are, is it all, is there one person watching this or if you're trying to, you know, reuse the cardboard or whatever, or, or you know, do you have to have several people? I, I'm just trying to have a better vision for Yeah, that. so we're trying to figure that out too, Senator Pearson, when I mean, we literally just turned this unit on last week. Um, okay. So, you know, we've got one person obviously that needs to, you know, manage the material on the tip floor and load the hopper. Um, and really the unit runs itself. There's not a lot to do behind the scenes. Um, obviously we're gonna need to monitor the boxes um, and work the baler, but I don't, you know, maybe two people, three people, tops maybe. Fascinating, okay. Yeah, and, and to your point about a grand opening, we had planned on um, doing that. It's a little challenging with the pandemic, um, but certainly, uh, you know, any, any one of you who wants to come over and check it out, we can, we can figure something out. Absolutely, it's it's really amazing to see. It, it's very <clears throat> impressive, and a lot of credit goes to Mike Casella. Um, he really worked hard um, getting seeing this project constructed and and, and finished. Do that. Uh, do they have other plant? Or not you folks, but are there other plants? Uh, is that the same as Maine or Pennsylvania? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a similar operation. I I you know I don't I've never been to the one in Maine, so I don't want to speak too much about that. But that is a depackaging facility, as far as I can understand. Um, and you know, without one in in Vermont, that material has to go out of state to be managed. It, it can't go for disposal anymore. So we needed an in-state option to manage it. Yeah, uh, well, I think, and the committee can pick up on this if I'm wrong. I thought we heard that that Maine uh, they had a lot of plastic that also got through the process and into the into the meter. Did we hear that or or not? Well, I think I think some of the concern um, with what's going to Maine. Um, so I was at a Act 148 stakeholder meeting about a year ago. And they had a representative from AgriCycle and from Hannaford's come in and talk about that process. And Hannaford's liked sending that material to that operation because it was easier for them. Um, it was cost effective for them. It was less labor intensive. Um, but you know, there is there is material that's mixed, right? There's source separated mixed with not source separated material. So. You know the the issue with microplastics is is a problem. It's um, you know it's in compost and it's in digestate. Um, and you know we certainly have no interest in you know contributing <laughs> to an issue. We we want to work with this technology to try to resolve that issue the best that we can. Yeah, Kim. Um, yep. So do you do I have it right that you set the machine up? and you run you know an hour of meat and then you switch the machine around and you run an hour of crackers or whatever like it, it, is that is yeah. that the premise because the it, it, it's automated but uh up to a point i'm guessing yeah we we can we can process um organics from our um commercial and residential collection route and i've got some photos of that it actually comes out pretty clean 
Um, and it's and it's great because it removes a lot of the a lot of people are using the compostable bags. Yeah. Um, so we can remove a lot of that. And we actually brought one test load or, um, already over to uh, a certified compost facility. So it's nice and clean. Huh. All right. it, was, it was actually amazing to see how clean it, it did come out. So besides meat, you run a lot of other products through oh, there, or you yeah, will absolutely. do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Linda, if you want to go to the next slide. There's the actual unit itself while it was being installed. So that long sort of chamber there is where the paddles are inside. And that big sort of black thing is where the hopper feeds into that unit. Comes The material moves up that chute and feeds into the unit and then disperses to either chute. Hmm. Um, it's, and it's, it looks small in this photo, but it's actually quite <laughs> large and, and really impressive how um, quiet it is and um, how you know fast it can it can process material. Um, so then the next slide. So here's some examples of the material that we can process. So Ben and Jerry's ice cream that's either expired or it's off spec. Um, I believe the Ben and Jerry's this material was coming out of the St. Albans plant and was going um, to Hudson Falls to a waste incinerator that will now will be able to separate out here with this unit and capture the organics um, and dispose of the, of the packaging. Um, the photo on the right is expired baby formula. So you can imagine how labor intensive it would be to have to empty every single one <laughs> of those containers. Um, and this was the first um, material that we ran last week. Um, and those lids are made out of a, um, a number five plastic, which especially when it's really cold, gets really brittle and does break apart. So we might have to adjust screens and add an additional screen at the end of the shoot to get, to get some of that plastic out that comes out. Um, so, you know, addressing upstream packaging that manufacturers and producers are using is I think gonna be part of this equation, whether the material is going for compost or um, to a digester. And the bottom picture is our organics collection route um, that we brought in and ran through and brought over to the compost place. Okay, Linda, next slide. So this is another great example of the material that we get um, requests to dispose of. So the top left is a vitamin supplement. Um, and the two other photos are, there's some off spec um, beer that wasn't pasteurized correctly. Um, and I think the bottom is cider. So some, some labor on our part is required here, right? We're gonna have to take the plastic off. We're gonna have to remove the containers from inside those boxes. But you know, that wasn't something that the facility was, was able to do. Um, but we're able to do now with our, with our facility. But it seems like we, it seems like we have an awful lot of food going to waste. Right. And though that's another part of the equation, Senator Starr, right, is reduction. Um, and I, you know, when you look at that amount of baby formula, uh, you know, what is the solution? How do you, how do you reduce that from happening? Well, one way would be to <laughs> expire it two weeks earlier and then put it out the last two weeks to be distributed to people. <laughs> but anyway, Brian, Senator yeah. Collimore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And maybe I missed this, Kim, and if I did, I apologize. How much does this machine cost? Um, this was a $4 million investment for us. Yep. For one machine? Yeah, for the whole building and the tanks wow. and the, yep. Okay, yep. thank you. Sure. I have a question. Mm -hmm. how, does, how does the money flow around this? In other words, if I'm, a, if I, if I'm the beer company and I didn't pasteurize my beer, I, I get it to you. You're doing me a service in a sense. I mean, just yep. wondering how you, how, who pays for what in this, in this system? The, the generator. Yeah. Pay, a, pay a fee to bring their material to it, just like in, just like any other facility. 
as if as if same as going to the dump or the recycling right. depot. Yep. 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 And and a, lot and of these, a, a lot of these generators, especially if it's beer, they they want a, a you know a, a certificate of destruction. They don't want they want to know that this material has been destroyed. And we're going to be able to do that. And we had we were able to do that on the disposal side, but we're now going to be able to do that also with this facility with the process that we're putting in place. And there's a different there's a different cost for different materials. I would say like there's beer has a price and Twinkies has a price. Or... Yeah, I don't. I mean, again, this is we literally are still in the trialing phase, so I don't even think that we've fine tuned. The okay, cost I was yet. just curious. <laughs> um, <laughs> In a related question, Kim, then does yeah. Magic Hat just pay you as if you're an electric producer, or or and you know it's it, it's only so much of our business, but just trying to understand, you've obviously designed this in a symbiotic way, which is pretty fantastic, and right. I'd, love, I'd love to understand their piece of this. Yeah, um, it, it would be worth actually maybe inviting them in to to explain what they do. Um, I, I believe we have a contract with them. I'm not sure of the details I could find out though. Any other questions? I, I think I have one last slide possibly. There's an overview of the general tip floor. You can see the hopper in the back, um, the baler over to the right for the cardboard. Um, and then one of the chutes where the material comes out um, next slide. Some of the material as it's been processed, that's dry, right? So there's some nice organic looking material. And the picture on the left and the far, the shoot in the far back is the one that the packaging is coming out of. So you do, or do you have a dryer there or is that dried product that went through the process? A dried product that went through, yep. And sometimes, you know, as we as we're working out this system and how to how to operate it, we might figure out that adding water is is a better solution than processing it dry. That that looks like it would make good chicken feed. Yeah, <laughs> it does. I think that's vitamin supplement. They'd be pretty healthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the next slide. I think this is the last one, and that's just a picture of one of the tanks that we can store the organic slurry prior to being transferred over to the digester. Yeah. So again, you know, we're still in the testing phase. Um, as, as I mentioned, we just turned on the unit for the first time last week. We're trying to figure out the best way to operate the, the, the unit. Um, we figure it's probably going to take a whole year to nail that process down as we go through each season. Um, and initially, we're, our plan is to pretty much only process the material that we handle. But at some point, we are hoping that we can open it up to a you know third-party hauler. Yeah. So, hey, well, uh, questions? Uh, Senator Calmore. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. This is just a comment, not a question, Kim. I, being from Rutland, I, I have the advantage of remembering back when John and Doug Casella began the company, and I just have to marvel. I mean, they started with one pickup truck and began right. picking up people's garbage. And here they are, uh, a company that uh, that gives back tremendously, by the way, to the community. Uh, I, I just wonder whether John or Doug ever imagined what would, uh, you know, what they'd be looking at when they first started. So it's a great company. Well, thank you for saying yeah. that. I appreciate that. Um, we certainly are trying to be, you know, uh, on the cutting edge of technology and, and you know, John has said himself multiple times, we'll cannibalize ourselves before we, you know, if we have to, in order to, you know, save landfill space, so. Yeah, uh, Senator Polina. Do you, you Casella own or operate these facilities in other states? You mentioned there's some in Maine, Massachusetts. Do you, um, no. uh, do you own those or? No. Is no. this your first one? This is the first one, yep. Right. This is the yeah. only, first and only one in Vermont too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it would be good if uh, Chris could get over and look the yeah. thing over uh, yeah. and he could report back to the rest of us that live away. Um, yeah. Chris, did you have a question? Or? Yes, I'll, I'll take some video and uh, you can help me share it on the screen there, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I, 
<clears throat> so one is Linda saying we got to move on, but Kim, are you guys a big enough player now that you're really in the region? There is a fair bit of manufacturing of food in the and processing food. Are you a big enough player to talk about the upstream packaging with with people, or is that part of the vision down the road? I'm just curious. Uh, you know, that's a what you guys are doing is amazing, but but upstream is where we start to really make the whole thing a little easier, I would guess. Yeah, I did participate in the Vermont Product Stewardship Institute this summer on. Uh, an EPR bill on packaging. Um, so yes, we are a big enough player to want to be part of those conversations. Absolutely. Yep. If we could get into a biodegradable packaging uh, system, you know, products, uh, that would be great. Um, yep. Well, uh, I think Kim will we'll, uh, move on and uh, certainly um, appreciate you being with us and um, you know uh, Cassell is doing a great job uh, of course up where I live uh, I live of just 10 or 12 miles from the Cassell waste site in, in Coventry and yep. it, that runs uh, <clears throat> that runs very smoothly up there they do an excellent job and and uh, so thanks a lot for for everything. Thank you for having me. Chris, I could, uh, Senator Pearson, I can be in touch with you about getting you over to the site once we're fully operating, if you like. Yeah, when it makes sense. I, I, yeah. I You've just piqued my curiosity. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> when, when it could happen, I'd be great, glad to do it. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, welcome, Carrie, and uh, uh, you're gonna talk to us a little bit about uh, Ayers Hill Farm Creamery. Um, We've heard uh, we've heard from Senator Parent quite a bit about that, and um, and it's great that you could be with us this morning um, to tell us uh, all about it. Well, <clears throat> we ain't perfected it yet. Um, it's a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work. Um, We've already been asked quite a few times, would we do it again? I'm not sure that the answer on that. <laughs> I'll know more in 10 years. Um, so we, our creamery came in August and uh, it's going well, the milk is really selling. Um, but it kind of, we knew there wasn't much money in the fluid milk and that's holding true. Um, if you're going to sell, you got to sell on a lar large volume or you've got to do value added. Um, so right now we've only branched out to, we've got whole milk, white whole milk, we've got chocolate milk, and we've got uh, cheese curds. Um, yeah. cheese, they're all a hit. There were, I mean, we're out, uh, we know we're nine miles from town, we're right literally on the Canadian border. So people have to seek us out. We are in... Main Street Market in Richford. Um, that's a blessing and a curse. I mean, it puts us out there, but we're on their schedule. Um, you know, I'll get an email, got an email last night, need a delivery for tomorrow. You know, they need 30 gallons of white and so much of chocolate. And we shipped 90 gallons to them last week. Um, we don't have the storage here. You know, I'm trying to run the farm. My husband, Nick, uh, works for CDL. The maple sugaring equipment company plus it's getting near sugaring season and we just don't have employees um so it's there's definitely interest there's definitely interest from the community um i was probably slower getting on the whole buy local than other people um you know we're, we're farmers you know so when i go to hannaford i usually by store brand. I don't you know, support the local farmer, no, uh, so to speak, just because of the money issue. Um, we're selling our milk for $5 a gallon. You know, you can go in and buy hood. Um, I think it's $4.69 right now. Uh, so we are a little bit more expensive. Um, plus people have to travel to us. We have a little farm stand right here uh, in our driveway. We're about a quarter mile from the farm. Um, 
we've had quite a few people want to tour the farm, check out the creamery. Um, we, I think there was one day since August, since we opened up that we haven't had a customer. And that was when, that was our first little snowstorm when it was 20 degrees there a month or two ago. Every day we've had, we've had somebody. Um, yeah. It's been very well received and we're shocked. We are, we are really shocked, but our biggest hangups got to be employees. Um, keeping the farm running, keeping the farm stand stocked, um, you know, and same with Nick doing his, his job. Um, we're, we have a cream separator that we're going to start um, and a butter churn we have on order, but everything's back ordered because of COVID. Um, so we do plan on getting into the butter. Um, it's coming, it's coming just slow. And it's, you, it's neat, it is, it's neat. Um, do, you, uh, do you do this all yourself or do you have somebody that helps you or? It's just Nick, it's just myself and my husband and my cat. <laughs> um, it, yeah, no, it's just, it's just Nick and I. Um, it's too much, right now it's too much. We're, you know, everybody starts out that way, you know? But you can't really hire anybody on. There's not. There's no profit margin right now, you know. Yeah. So we get out into the yogurt, and we he started some keeper. Just just we're just playing with different products and stuff like that. Um, but there's so little margin that when you know when you sell to a store and you give them twenty percent off, you're not really making anything um, on the fluid milk. So they they take like out of your five dollars, they take a dollar, so it leaves you four. And yep. then you have to transport it. I have to, to transport store. it, take time from the farm to transport it. Um, yeah, you know, and we're not, we're not big. So we just, when they call for an order, we're generally scrounging around to produce it. You know, it's, it's not, it's about a six, seven hour process between start and finish. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very time consuming. I've had a lot yeah. of um, farmers interested in about it and asked about it. Um, I try to be as upfront with them. It's not that I don't want the competition, but I just, I just, not that it wasn't a smart idea. Um, it's difficult. Yeah. I think Senator Polina has a question, yep. Anthony. I'm just wondering what kind of volume you're doing, or could you say it based on how many cows you're, you're, you're milking or oh, cows that sort of fitting into your farm? Yep. Um, so we milk uh, 200 cows. Well, we were uh, with DFA when we cut back with the whole COVID. Um, we're milking 185 right now. I'm still over quota. Um, and we can do 45 gallon batches at a time. Uh, and we're been, we've been doing like five batches a week, um, which is, I mean, good for our, for our size, but we, we need to be bigger to, if we wanted to make money on it, you have to sell volume. Sure. And we, we knew that, but we knew, we also knew that this is getting our foot in the door. This is getting the community, see what interest there is there and slowly branch out into different products, time allowing, and if we can find some employees. So I'm wondering, and I don't mean, I don't, if you don't want to talk about this, that's fine, but I'm wondering a little bit about how much it costs you to set up and whether or not COVID funds had anything to do with it. Yes. Now I did apply for two different grants. Um, they helped tremendously. Uh, we, that we started this on our own before that ever happened and I'm grateful that it did happen. Um, so the creamery itself was around 70,000, uh, all the, all, all the equipment. Um, the problem was what I didn't figure in was the $30,000 upgrade for power. Um, the farm was maxed out. So we'd already ordered all this stuff and come to find out we don't have enough power on the farm. Um, so it was, it's not so much the creamery, it's all the incidentals. Uh, then you have to buy, you have to buy, um, jugs or, you know, the jugs, another thing, like, I mean, we're, we're you know, I, I like cows <laughs> and I, I don't, I've never worked in a store. I've never, there's just some things, no matter how prepared you think you are, you're not, um, in order for us to get the jug, the cap and the label under a dollar per container, we had to buy $11,000 worth of jugs and $4,000 worth of labels. Um, so that's all, that's all overhead. That's all in a container. Um, 
mm-hmm. but we had to, we had to get the you know we had to get labels five thousand of each uh, each label because to get our cost down. Um, but so that got was, labels for a while. Yeah. So you've lost another dollar in the jug. So now you're down to three dollars mm-hmm. because you had five at the end. Store keeps a dollar. <laughs> A doll, those jugs that's expensive for it yep, seems um, like for a pretty cheap jug it is it is and we've got the cheapest cap yeah. you know the each cap is five cents and they come in a quantity of 2500 um yeah. we were the first initial three four batches um we were putting our own labels on uh, then that became too cumbersome too too time consuming um, so we have to order eight cases of each container in order for the jug company to apply the labels. And you got different sizes, different kinds. Uh, do yep. you do chocolate milk? We do do chocolates. We do four different sizes in white and three different sizes in chocolate. Yeah. So you had seven different labels then. You, yep. Yeah. And then the cheese curd yep. labels, um, There's we do three different. We do uh, buffalo, garlic, pepper, and original, and the same thing in order to get the labels and the packaging where we were going to make a profit um, and still sell competitively. We, I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere, and um, we don't want, we don't necessarily want to be in stores. We want to bring the consumer here to the farm. We want them to ask questions. We want to put a face with it. I, that's kind of what we are. That was our idea, I guess. Yeah. Um, the, um, did, have you applied, um, to the working lands grant program? Yep. We were awarded the uh, working lands grant and we were awarded the dairy, I think it was dairy processor grant. Yeah. Um, so we were able to, we were able to apply that money towards some of the costs, but it's, I mean, when it's a new business. So you're you, every, every time you turn around, I mean, there's thousands of dollars going out the door. You're not talking hundreds, you're talking thousands. Um, you know, for a cream separator, they wanted 60 grand. Uh, we found one second hand for 12,000. Uh, comes to find out that the, it's not the right power source. So it's power from Europe. Um, if we can change it over, it's gonna be like 1500 bucks to change the power over. Um, we're just getting started, you know. It's so it's, you know, there's days where we're looking at each other, thinking, well, "Why did we do this?" Um, but you know, like we have fresh cheese curd day, and it when that happens, they there's just there's a constant stream of people. Um, it's a self serve. Uh, we have a square register. People come whenever they want. Um, but we also had to branch out into the meat. Uh, so we've got USDA, we got um, beef and steaks here on the farm that from the cows. And that seems to what's bringing the people, the people will come and get their hamburger and grab a jug of milk. Yeah. If we had just milk standing alone, we, we, we would have already shut it down. Well, you're going to end up with your own store here. You keep going beef and then get some berries and Fresh veggies. <laughs> now I got pigs <laughs> uh, and chickens on the way. Yeah, uh, Senator Pearson has a question. Yeah, th- thank you, Carrie. I'm 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 often struck at uh, y- you know the kind of work you're describing. It's really where we were. It's old fashioned in a way, and yet you're cutting edge. And and congratulations, and uh, I wish you a lot of success. Can you just talk? In the legislature generally, we focus a lot on broadband and what it means to rural communities and businesses. And can you talk about uh, that? What do you, do you have decent broadband? What is the internet piece of this? Is that part of your puzzle? Uh, just help us understand because we're dealing with that not in this committee, but across the board. Uh, broadband's a huge issue. Um, we actually tried getting some security cameras for the shack and the broadband wasn't enough. Um, so we had to go with a simpler version. Um, the square register runs on Wi-Fi. Um, there's just simply not enough. 
even with the farm on the farm end, there's just not enough. It's not fast enough. It's, it goes in and out. Um, we have good days, bad days. When it rains, we don't have good service. Um, <laughs> it's um, so are there other questions? Uh, have you thought about, is there anything that uh, we, we should be doing to help uh, small startup uh, operations like yours? Uh, I mean, did the ag agency use you good? Could they have used you better? Uh, environmental issues, uh, you know, economic issues. Are, are there things that we could be doing uh, uh, to make life um, easier for operations to get started? Um. I was treated well, I can't complain about that. Um, when I called for questions, I got the help. Um, I've been dealing with Tony Kitsos from UVM Extension. Uh, he's been helping us come up with a business plan and actually what direction do we want to take this? Where are we making money? Where are we losing money? Um, I gotta say the biggest thing is, is, is employees. We need competent employees. Yeah. Uh, that's the biggest hole. Yeah, and, and you know, we hear that every day from whoever we have in, uh, you know, from big businesses to small businesses to truck drivers uh, uh, to just regular laborers. Uh, it's, it's really a, a major problem. That's where there we we're trying to decide as a farm uh, what direction are we going to go in and, and we keep coming back to the whole labor um i just re recently tried to become an h2a employer uh for a visa and that's a lot of red tape i've been approved but now um my two employees that were coming from south africa the border has been shut down so we're in limbo there waiting to see what happens um yeah. But yeah, just say labor was the biggest, um, the biggest deal. Yeah. Carrie. Um, if, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Carrie. Uh, Carrie, if you could get to, you know, how many, I, I know you and I have I've talked about uh, those two employees, but long term, you know, looking three, four or five years down the road, what type of employment prospects do you, you know, how many, how much labor do you think you'd need? Um, um, I need, I need two solid, I need four people. I need four full-time people. Um, I have two Hispanics that are milking husband, wife team, and they're awesome. Um, and now I'm trying to get two um, outdoor people, uh, crops, maintenance. Um, there's just not a labor pool. I've tried for two and a half years, uh, applying through, um, posting job ads through Craigslist, Facebook, and Indeed. And it's not. It's not a good site out there. <laughs> uh, and we've changed, you know, I, I'm not asking for 80 hour work, work weeks, I'm asking for 40 and housing and, you know, 1650 with housing, everything included. I don't think that's a bad uh, start and you still can't get anybody. No. And probably all the milk they can drink as well. <laughs> that's right, and beef. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and some maple syrup probably. on the side. Boy, 1650 and, and with all bennies, I mean, that adds up to real, real money. It's, uh, I always thought it was the money, um, but it's not. That's not, that's not no, the issue. It just won't work. Just uh, won't yeah. work. We had, we had testimony the other day from a, a farm, a farmer, and um, they said that their most reliable help was, uh, from 50 years old and up. Uh, and, and they would hire people even 70 years old if they were wanted a job yep. because they know, knew that they would show up at eight o'clock in the morning or whenever. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, it's, uh, it's a crazy issue we got facing us. Maybe uh, we have too many giveaway programs. I totally agree with that. Um, but anyhow, um, 
we've got to uh, we've got to jump on to another meeting. Uh, I have one other question. Uh, speaking of the UBM uh, person that helped you with your uh, financial plan, uh, was that through VHCB? Yep, I dealt with Tony Kitzels for a while, but I, I did get hooked up through VHCB with them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you if you run across anything that you think that we could be of assistance uh, with, you know, uh, give Corey a call or you know any one of us a call. Uh, you know, I work on all kinds of issues from unemployment to, to getting signed up to get your vaccine. <laughs> right. Yep. Uh, and and uh, but if if you need anything that you feel that we can help you with, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you know, we're we're here to serve you people and and uh, so anyways, um, did you have anything else you wanted to add, uh, Gary? Oh, I think I'm all set. Well, thank, thanks for the time. I appreciate yeah, it. Uh, Senator Pearson uh, well, has a statement or a question. Yeah, just mostly a comment because I, I, I live in Chittenden County and everybody likes to think Chittenden County is different. We hear the same issues from labor folks, uh, about labor folks on farms and businesses in Chittenden County you know this is a real dynamic and and uh i just i want i would just caution you just obviously it doesn't get easier it, up uh by the border where you guys are but uh but it's an issue everywhere uh i, I promise you that but thank you yep. for, for this yeah, a great you. story and, and i wish you a lot of luck yeah yeah it was great uh, so uh thanks again and um uh, Guys, we got to jump on to the other meeting uh, with Working Lands um, for ten o'clock. So we'll see you. We'll see you there. And thanks again, uh, yep. Carrie. Yep. Thank you.